In this video, we're looking at this incredible passage, Matthew 28, and the sermon I preached from this section I called, The King Has Risen. Being the Easter story, this may be a very familiar passage to you, but it truly is an incredible story, and we mustn't let familiarity with it uh, cause us to not see the wonder of what is taking place in this passage. This is uh, a record of the events that have changed history as we know it. This is the story that shows why our salvation is secure, because the tomb was empty on that Easter Sunday. So as always, I encourage you just take some time, read the passage a few times, and just note down interesting things, perhaps things that as you read it slowly, you'll notice some key repetition or interesting details that Matthew records that the other gospel writers don't record. And then we've got to ask the question, well, why does Matthew record this in this way? Why does he put in the details that he puts in and leave out details that other gospel writers put in? And as we ask those questions, it will become increasingly clear as we dig in what Matthew's emphasis is in this section. And also spend some time praying, asking God to help you to understand his word so that his truth would impact you and equip you to teach others. Now, on reading through a narrative like this, there's a really helpful tool called the narrative plot arc that just helps you to work out the structure of a passage. And in this plot arc, we're looking for what is the setting? What is the source of conflict? Any good story has a conflict. What is the point of climax in the story? How does the story then resolve from that point? And what is the new setting? As I read the story a number of times, I saw, okay, the setting is here um, in verse 1. So just verse 1, where we see uh, the two Marys go to Jesus' tomb on that Sunday morning. Uh, the conflict builds in verse 2 all the way up to verse 8, where we see an earthquake, an angel, and unconscious guards uh, set an unexpected scene as the women are told that uh, he is not here. These great words, he is not here, he has risen from the dead. He's not here, he's risen from the dead, just as he said. He has risen. And after seeing the empty tomb, we're told that they hurry away to go and tell his disciples. Now, I think the climactic point comes in verses 9 to 10. Uh, this section here. Where on their way to tell the disciples, Jesus met them. Suddenly, Jesus met them. And they held on to him and worshipped him. And Jesus repeats the angels' instructions as they are told they should go and tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee. The resolution then comes in verse 11 to 17. 11 to 17. Where we see uh, the story in this section we hear of a lie being spread by the Roman soldiers and the religious leaders. But then we see the disciples responding in worship, which is the right response to the risen king. And then the new setting, verse 18 to 20, uh, Jesus gives the command to make disciples. Because this one with all authority demands all allegiance from all people. 18 to 20 being the final section there. Now, in a narrative also, it's worth just looking out for the different characters. And we see uh, we've got Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Uh, the woman are a key character in the, the beginning half of the story. The next character to appear is the angel, an angel of the Lord. His appearance is like lightning, his clothes as white as snow, and the gods are terrified of him. And the angel speaks to the woman. So the angel is a character worth noting in the beginning of the story, and then the next character are uh, the gods themselves, who at the end of chapter 27 were told to stand guard to make sure that Jesus' disciples didn't come and steal Jesus' body. And so the gods are standing guard there. But then we see that they, uh, in this scene, 
become like dead men. They are absolutely terrified of uh, the scene unfolding in front of them. Now, when they eventually wake up uh, from fainting, a little bit later, they go and they're given this large sum of money and they go and spread the, the lie about Jesus that his disciples came and stole the body. But they are uh, characters who are, are worth looking out for. Obviously, the key character in this section is our Lord Jesus, who the women were looking for, and they are told he's not here. He has risen, just as he said. And they are told to go tell his disciples, Jesus' disciples, there they will see him. He has risen. And in this climactic moment, suddenly, Jesus met them. The resurrected king uh, meets them. They worship him. And Jesus gives them uh, this instruction where they come to him. They clasp his feet. They worship him. And Jesus then gives them the instruction to say, uh, go tell my disciples, go to Galilee. There they will see me. And we hear the report of them obeying. And they come and they see Jesus. And Jesus gives them uh, the command saying, go and make disciples of me. He's told them, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now we're going to see that Matthew's gospel is a very carefully crafted. And just this at the end here, I am with you always. Uh, back in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, uh, Joseph was told that uh, he, he must be given the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So God with us arrived in chapter 1 and God with us, Jesus, says, I'm going to be with you always to the very end of the age. And then the other important character in here is Jesus' disciples. And so the women are told by the angel to go tell the disciples. And then while they are on their way to tell the disciples, they meet Jesus, who also tells them to go and tell my brothers, that's his disciples, some other important repetition we see so the gods are afraid we see much uh, fear but then the angel says do not be afraid and we're told they left they hurried from the tomb afraid yet filled with joy and then when they meet jesus he also says do not be afraid and this is a phrase that's worth uh, tracking throughout the bible throughout this glorious story when a messenger from god says do not be afraid it is very, very good news indeed. And that's what we see uh, in this story. The angel says, don't be afraid. Then Jesus comes and says, don't be afraid. And they shouldn't be afraid because the best news has been announced. He is not here. He has risen. Tell them he's risen from the dead. This is the most glorious news uh, in this section. The, the king who came to save his people from their sins. He's risen from the dead, proving that the reason for his coming was effective. He came to save his people from their sins, and that's exactly what he did. And the right response to this risen king is what we see the woman doing here. They worship him in verse 9. Uh, we see the disciples do this here. They worship him in verse 17. He is the king who demands worship. He, he demands allegiance from all people because he is the one with all authority. So all people should worship him. Just a few other bits of information. So we've got this violent earthquake and they shook. Uh, the Greek word is the same word here, uh, seismos. And it's seismos or sizio again here. Um, and this is megas, mega, mega earthquake. So a mega earthquake takes place. Um, this scene described here is an absolutely terrifying scene. The, the guards uh, being so afraid and shaking and becoming like dead men is actually a, a natural response to a scene that is absolutely terrifying. Yes, the guards uh, shake and become like dead men. And I think it's quite funny that the woman seeing the same scene 
don't um, faint with fright. But I think that's also an indication that these are our women of faith. They, they've seen incredible things happening. So they've almost uh, become, become accustomed to seeing the impossible taking place. But they were also terrified. So the angel says to them, don't be afraid. And they don't need to be afraid because the Jesus who was crucified is not here. He's risen, just as he said. And Jesus had said a number of times uh, to them, on multiple occasions. If you want to go look uh, for a few of those in Matthew 16, 21, 17, verse 23, 20, verse 19, uh, back in 12, verse 40, uh, 17, verse 9, 26, verse 32. Jesus had said, he had told them, he said he was going to die, but he also said that he would be raised. And God always keeps his promises. And so the angels say, come see, come see. I've opened the tomb, not so that Jesus could get out. I've opened the tomb so that you can see where he lay. He's not there anymore. Now go, tell his disciples. Now Matthew does some beautiful things uh, in this section that show how the whole gospel just holds together. Uh, here in verse 8, where the women hurry away from the tomb, afraid, yet uh, filled with joy. Uh, this phrase is, um, they've got mega joy. So it's a mega joy. And the, the last time that we saw these two words used together um, was in Matthew 2, where the wise men, right at the beginning of the story, came and as they saw the star resting over the place where Jesus was laid, we are told that they were filled with mega joy, great joy, just before they went in and met Jesus. And here these women, yes, they're afraid. That's understandable. They've seen the most terrifying scene, but they're filled with this mega joy just before they meet the resurrected Jesus. So uh, Matthew is, is showing us... Uh, a repetitive theme that we see in the gospel and not only do we see this mega joy in that same story in Matthew 2 verse 11 we see that the right response to the newborn king was great joy and worship and we see it here again these women worship him and the disciples also end up worshipping him. Now Matthew could have just said, suddenly Jesus met them, uh, they came to him and worshipped him. But I think it's important to note that he says they clasped his feet um, to show that he's not a ghost. He actually had feet. This was a physical resurrection. Jesus the man was raised from the dead and they worshipped him as God because he is truly man and truly God. And his resurrection is the point that absolutely proves that. And this is the truth that they are told to go quickly and, and tell. Uh, we see this repetition as well. Uh, tell his disciples as they are on their way to tell. And then Jesus says, go and tell my disciples. This is the truth that needs to be told. But what we see here is this is the truth that the chief priests absolutely don't want to get out. So they come up with a really terrible story. And while you were asleep, um, they came and stole the body. Now, these are highly trained Roman soldiers. It's a completely ridiculous story that never could have happened. Um, and yet that's the story that they decided to spread because they would rather have a terrible story spreading than the truth spreading, that this king has risen that he is with them and he is the one to be worshipped. That's the truth they didn't want to get out. There's another repetition in a story. It's always worth looking out for repeated place names. And in this section, we see Galilee mentioned a number of times. So the angel told them to say, you'll meet him in Galilee, you'll meet him in Galilee. And then they met him in Galilee. And again, it's worth asking the question, why does Matthew want us not to miss that detail? And I think it's important because we can go and see in uh, 
Earlier on in Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 4, just as Jesus begins his ministry, um, Matthew quotes from Isaiah chapter 9, and he mentions Galilee of the Gentiles. So it's Galilee of the Gentiles. And that's that incredible passage that um, the people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. And you see in Matthew's gospel that it's Galilee of the Gentiles. This is good news for both Jews and Gentiles. And Matthew's wanted us to see that all the way from the beginning. We see that with the Magi arriving, the nations coming to worship the king. And then the king begins his ministry in chapter 4. And then chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount is on a plain in Galilee. The message is going out to both Jews and Gentiles. And here, right at the end, Matthew is making that clear. This is good news of a risen king for all people, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Jesus has conquered death. He's risen. And so this isn't just an incidental mention of Galilee. Uh, the king has come, uh, he's risen, and this is good news for all people. And the disciples' response is right. They worshipped him. I do think it's worth noting that some doubted. We see here some doubted. And this story is worth cross-reading uh, with uh, Matthew 14, where we see uh, Simon Peter steps out onto the lake as Jesus comes walking on the water to him. And then he starts sinking because he doubted. That's the only other time that that word for doubt is used. But then just after Simon Peter sinks uh, in 14, so that's 14 verse 31. And then in 14 verse 33, um, we see the disciples worship Jesus again. So these themes of uh, doubt and worship with the disciples are there introduced in chapter 14, we see that they're still there at the end. There are still some doubting, which shows that they're very human. Um, the most incredible events in history had just taken place, and they still weren't sure. And so then Jesus comes to them and says, I've got all authority. Get rid of all doubt. And therefore go. And this is the key instruction. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am Emmanuel, I'm with you always, to the very end of the age. This one with all authority demands allegiance from all people. So go and tell the nations about him. Call them to worship him. Uh, this passage should thrill our hearts with joy as we see the risen king. But we shouldn't only just be rejoicing and worshiping him, uh, the king commissions his disciples to go and make disciples. And their commission is our commission still today. We are called to make disciples of Jesus. And this story of the king, the risen king, should cause us to want, to want all people to know him. We should want people to respond to him with great joy and with worship. And we should want them to be disciples of King Jesus too. And so this familiar story should cause us to be a people who want to go and tell. And that's what they were told there, go, go, go. And they obeyed. And this message has been spreading around the globe. And we want that to continue. So let's continue to rejoice in the risen King. Let's worship him and let's go and tell the world all about him. And he promises to be with us to the very end of the age. So we go in his strength. The king, the one with all authority is with us. So we go and we tell the world of him. Well, God bless as you dig in further.